What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Likes and Cash podcast. Today, we covered a bunch of things, as in, there's a problem in your business. What is the fix? We gave you a very clear six step checklist that you can follow to find where the fix is. If you feel stressed and overwhelmed in your business, what is the right move to come up with the right answer? Hope you enjoy. We're getting requests now. You want to start with the requests? Yeah, let's start with requests. We're uh, yeah, because now now people like here. yeah, there you go. Now we're famous. This this is podcast number seventeen for the Lexington Cash podcast. Yeah, we're we're moving. We're moving. Are we in the top one percent yet? I think that people don't get past ten episodes or something like that. We're in the top one percent of podcasts. <laughs> let me let me re-record that. Put in. that in my bio. Yeah, that there you go. <laughs> Welcome to Lexington Cash podcast, top one percent of podcasts. We should totally change your like Saint Cash handle into the podcast handle. <laughs> one half of the like Saint, the one half of the at like Saint Cash pod with a little microphone uh, emoji. <laughs> oh, we could, yeah. Like we got. Well, what do you mean in our in your Twitter bio? Just one half of at like Saint Cash. <laughs> I think uh, doesn't Sam have that? Sam Parr have that? Where it's or it's just this host uh, at my first million or something like that. I don't know. Anyways, let's do requests. Let's go. So. First question I got was, hi, Marcos. There's been a lot of chatter about rebranding on X recently. I think NFT God's step-by-step roadmap to slowly change his name and pick was quite interesting. And for anyone who doesn't know, he's one of the most trending names in our space, NFT God. He's in with like Elon Musk now and all these people. He's big for breaking down the algorithm, um, like in the coding space. Uh, so don't know if you guys take chopper requests. We do. But I think that it would be interesting to cover this on the Like Say Cash podcast. Starting with you, because you're, you're the first one. Of course we take them. Yeah, Don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> I yeah, got yeah. you. We, we do now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we're so um, fucking famous. So with, we both have good insight on this because uh, obviously I chose not to rebrand and JK has done a rebrand in a different way. So we both have good experience with this. Uh, so my company, for anyone who doesn't know, is The Birdhouse, which is a was a Twitter marketing agency, but now it's an X marketing agency. And I got asked about a hundred times, are you going to change it to the X house? <laughs> and my, my answer to that was two things. One, no, uh, just because I felt that I've already built enough of a brand around this name to not want to switch. Um, so I put a lot of effort into the branding side of it originally. Um, and like I, my team has hats, you know, <laughs> my, my team has the logo next to their name on X. Like there was a lot of things holding me back from that. And then two is more so from a marketing perspective and an authority perspective is like people want to work with agencies that have been around the block and not the new guy. So I don't want to change my agency's name and then look like the new guy chasing the X trend when I can be the birdhouse and be the, the guy that was around when Twitter was around. So that's my new positioning with, with the bird. And now I'm the biggest bird company in the world. <laughs> I like it. So I'll let you. I'll let you take because I know you. You rebranded. I I have rebranded plenty of times. I went from when I first started. I was I was a dating account. Like just uh, <laughs> can you imagine this? Just like the most introverted dude being a a social skills account. So that didn't work. Then I started just general stuff. Um, you know, life platitude advice. Uh, as a nineteen year old. And then I went um, ghostwriting and growth, and now I'm all like all about monetization. And every time I've rebranded, it's always been bigger in my head than it was on every other people's heads. And just as you were saying this, it reminded me of one of Dan Coe's banger tweets. I found it right here. It's from 2020. The amount of water needed to create an acre of fog is one drinking glass. Remember this the next time your mind is fogged with worry. But in reality, the problem is as insignificant as a glass of water. We worry about rebranding because we think, what if our audience hates us? What if our audience is going to be dead? Well, they don't think about you that much. Just just being honest. You know, when, I, when the crypto thing started to happen, I remember. Uh, it was 2021. I used to like write down my, what, what do you call it, your keys? Is that what you call it? Like the password on my yeah, ta- yeah, the, notebook? Uh, the, and like seed phrase. That yeah. You know the 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 words you they gave you they gave you. And I used yeah. to like keep it and I'm like, guys, don't ever share this because if not, we're going to be in trouble. Right. And I'm like, how do I keep this from the government finding out? And then a friend told me, Bro, you're not that important. Chill. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm not that important. So like it's it's all in your head. People people don't care. 
really. And the most tangible example I have of this is actually Mr. Fordway, Blake Rocha. I don't know if that's how you say it, but cool dude. Anyway, built a massive following on TikTok around trading and stocks. Huge. But then he transitioned to Airbnbs. Completely different niche. And I thought it was a dumb move. I'm going to admit, I thought it was stupid. And I thought, bro, you have 200 plus thousand followers on this. What are you doing? But he's killing it with the Airbnb thing. So when we did our call, I asked him, how was the transition? Like, how was the rebrand? And he said, bro, people literally transition overnight because they were not in the trading. They were not into trading. They were into me. So when people are into you, they forgive you for going into another path. It's fine because you are allowed to change your mind because they trust you, not the message. They trust you. And that trust is the key to rebranding. So I think maybe you're asking the wrong question. You should ask, how do I make people trust me more so that you can rebrand however many times you want instead of should I rebrand or not? That's a good one because I have the exact same problem right now with a much smaller number. Like I don't, for those who don't know, I made crypto TikToks in uh, 2021. So I have about 13,000 followers on TikTok. I have like three, 4,000, three, 3.3 on IG. I had like four on Twitter and I was from a crypto and NFT space, like my penguin profile picture and all this stuff. <laughs> so I essentially now want to make content around uh, Twitter, X, agencies, all of this business stuff. And I was, I had the same fear. I'm like, they're not going to like it. They're going to unfollow me. Uh, so, but I, I decided to just start making them and just stop checking the fucking engagement as if I care. <laughs> it's like, like St. Cash. <laughs> so there you go. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. The The moral of the story is, is like St. Cash. And if, just go do it. it. It's yeah. fine. Don't worry yeah. about it. The, you're the only well, one who cares. Well, this is a good segue because you rebranded also to monetization. And part of what we want to talk about today is not making your stuff free. And I'm curious what your thoughts on that are. Bro, I love that. I love that topic. So common phrase, this is one where I'm like, I disagree with make your free stuff better than everybody else's paid stuff. I don't disagree on the intent. I think it's great. I disagree on the possibility of it. I do not think it's possible because I don't know if you've spent thousands of dollars in, in something that didn't work out. Oh, you probably, cause you bought a bunch of courses, right? But even the things you spend a lot of money on that were not worth it, were worth it because they forced you to do something about your problem, mm -hmm. period. So if it's the bad services where you charge something, you make the person you sold it to like commit. If it's good or bad, that's another dilemma, but at least you made a higher commitment for them to do it. And I remember I had a course, it was called Bow and Arrow. Uh, that could have bought that course, I remember that. So that course, Bow, Bow and Arrow, it was called Bow and Arrow because uh, it was like a growth course on Twitter. And I essentially positioned as what you know is an arrow and how you say it is a bow. So I thought it was super clever with the bow and arrow analogy, right? And I gave it out for free. Nobody gave a shit. Like it was, uh, it's cool. Then I priced $300. I priced it at 300 bucks. And people were posting saying that was a really transformational course. It really helped them. And up until now, I made that mindset shift as in, by charging for stuff, you're actually adding value to the stuff because you're making it, you're making people commit to the thing. You're making people do it. So that's why I don't think you can make your free stuff more valuable than everybody else's paid stuff because there's not that commitment. There's a reason why you like the girl that poses a little bit of a challenge because it, I took, it takes a little more. I totally, I totally agree. And I think you changed my mind on this because I was big on the free stuff, uh, the free stuff thing. Uh, but I've noticed what you've said and I started to realize it. And this is partial part of the reason why I'm, I'm not going to come out with a free community. Like I originally planned. Um, it's just because Good. I think it, I think I'd rather do something paid and just not have to deal with like 500 people who have, have no commitment to the group. <laughs> so, uh, that I, I agree because I think the intrinsic value of paying for something is that you paid for it. Like the, the, the part of the value is the fact that you're committed. And, you know, like you said, even the stuff I've paid for that may not have been quote unquote worth it to me, I've still made my money back first of all, because I've like, 
a fire under my ass the second I pay a bunch of money on something. There's a fire under my ass to take action and make my money back right away so that I'd have no risk on the table. So even the stuff I paid a bunch of money for on programs, I made my money back somehow. You know what I mean? I go in and I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, but I, I, I totally agree. And I think it, it made you commit. Like, it just made you commit to doing it. And that's, yeah. That's, I like, that's huge. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like I just paid for a video editor. Right. And like for me is if you go to my YouTube, I haven't taken it serious at all. But now that I've paid for it, you bet your ass I will take it serious. Right. So like I could have just done YouTube for free for the past five years, but I haven't. Why? Because I didn't pay any money to commit to it. And I think the same thing, it's even more so elevated in a community aspect. Like you, you run a really great community. And I think any community that's free is just going to be intrinsically less valuable, less valuable than one that's paid because the people who are in it are less committed, which then makes the community worse. A hundred percent. I, and we transitioned into another one, which is community. Life Math Money had a beautiful tweet. I did not understand it then, but I understand it today, which was part of the reason why people pay more for stuff like access to luxury gyms or luxury clubs. It's not so, it's part of the gym and the club, that's part of it, but it's also because they don't want to hang out with the people who cannot afford it. Yes, it's discriminatory, discriminative, but it's still people, that's, that's part of it. I understand that, right? So when you go to the community aspect, you make it free. And what happens? Little Timmy goes in who has his offer and is just trying to sell it to everybody. And then they get a little bad taste in the mouth. And it's like, oh, when I go into Marcus's community, little Tim is going to pitch me his service. And I don't want that. I need to learn. Yeah. So, yeah, like the, the value of the community is also like who you let out. One time, bro, I got to tell you the story about Johan. Gangster. Move. So, Johan's our closer. And one time, uh, somebody hopped on a call with him. And just trying to like rub frame control, right? He's like, oh, so I guess you're basically kind of the closer, right? And Johan goes... That's part of it. I like to think more of it as a gatekeeper. I'm like, hmm, that's nice. Hmm, that's cool. <laughs> that was a good move because that's that awesome. is, yeah, that was good. That was a good frame control. So uh, communities, fuck making them free. Even low ticket, I hate it because I don't know, man. Maybe maybe I'm just burned out, but I don't like <laughs> low ticket. Yeah, stuff. well, I think, I think the problem with low ticket for someone who does high ticket is that you have both. And I think you just can't, like the whole point of low ticket is that you don't have to put as much effort into it. But if you have a high ticket already, you're already putting so much effort into a, a, a community, then the low ticket is just going to feel like a burden. You know what I mean? So I feel like if you're going to do low ticket, just have the low ticket and monetize high ticket a different way. Um, I think that either that or you have a team that can take care of the low ticket. I think those are like the real options. But I think for you, it's like once you had the high ticket, it's like, what was the point of the low ticket? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I co I, uh, I said it was a nurturing thing, but eh, I mean DMs is yeah. natural all the way. But I have a question for I you think on that actually. Uh, uh, so the question is, you have many like one of my favorite parts of this podcast is when it ends because you spit out game and I love it and I'm like oh my god this is so nice I gotta try it. So you spit out game but you keep it private and I understand why and I would do the same if I were you and I do the same still. How do you still find out what is worth posting on a timeline so people will consider it valuable? I think I have like imaginary rules for what I share. Like I never share specifics of offers. I rarely share specifics of price uh, scripts, like the, the, the specific things that make stuff tick but I'd share like the bones and the skeletons that so like people can build a foundation. So like, for example- Can you give me an example? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll give you an example. Like if I'm gonna tweet about this low ticket offer funnel, I'll tweet about the low ticket to high ticket funnel and the nurturing, and I'll tweet about like the the, the industry that the, the offer is in, but I'm not gonna say, you know, specifically if you have a, you know, coach monetization offer you should have it at $47 a month and then go up to $5,800 or $12,000 and then you know what I mean like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go super specific so I think for me it's like having enough mysticism and I've always done this naturally it's just having enough mysticism in my content to where it'll attract the people that it should attract but it'll deter the people that aren't going to be interested anyway so like anyone who's an actual coach will understand what I'm saying 
and anyone else is just not going to understand it. So it, it attracts people inbound who are actually interested in it. So it'll attract coaches or something like that, but it won't attract, you know, the regular beginner. I like it. The way I think about it, it's you give the what, not the how. So I just wrote up a case study. And one of the main reasons why this guy went from, dude, from losing 6K a month to making 100K a month. Crazy shit. One of the, yeah, crazy. In like four months. Awesome. So one of the parts of the case study was we really focused on their retention and their onboarding process. Now, most people don't focus on the retention and the onboarding process. It's all about just getting more leads. So when I was writing my case study, I didn't give them the how. This is the script. This is how you say it. Because... It's like I'm giving you a key, but there's a thousand doors. So it feels good having the key, but it's like you're going to be more confused because you don't know where to apply it. So instead I say, we want to give people an onboarding process that makes the customer feel like they have a plan and a future with them. And then when we go to the upsell, we give them a natural upsell into the next thing, which is their next goal. But when you give them like kind of that framework, I find that it does two things. It increases response rates because people want to do it with you. And two is um, it makes people, it, it attracts the right kind of people, the people who want the how, not the little tactics. Let's uh, let's go practical. The why. Because why, sorry. Let's go practical here into the what because you said something and I think this is something that I've been thinking about a lot and something, I saw a piece of content with, it was from Alex Ramosi talking about how info you know, once they watch the videos or they consume the thing, it becomes less valuable. How do you think about like St. Cash as a community? And how do you, or sorry, what do you do to try and build more of an MRR model uh, and treat it basically like a, like a, like a MRR SaaS and have people retain for essentially forever? Like, what are you, what are the kinds of principles you put into place? Because I think a big problem with, with some people's info businesses is that they sell once and then have nothing to sell again. But in my opinion, I think the right way to do it is combine the community and the and the info and just have it be forever. And you could just continue to sell months, years down the line and have it turn into an MRR model. I'm curious, wh- how do you think about that? And like, what do you what do you do to set up clients to essentially retain for longer than just like three or months or six months? Yeah, uh, the way I like to think about this, it's, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Oracle of Delphi. So the Oracle of Delphi was, basically this very powerful woman in ancient Greece that you never consulted often, but you went with her when you had a big decision to make. Should I go to war or not? What's going to happen? So I feel like in the beginning, I was positioning myself not as an oracle, but as a guide in their journey or like as a buddy that we're going to climb together. And I say, I will split it up into. So what people I've found is that they're afraid of They're not afraid of paying, but they're afraid of committing. So what I like to do is offer a shorter term in which we're going to be a guide for you. We're going to climb the mountain together. But at some point, you will get it. You will understand it. And then I transition from guide to oracle. As in, you will know what happens, but then every single decision you make or not, every single, when you make a decision, you will have more leverage on every decision. So for every good outcome, you will get a lot. But for every bad outcome, you will go back a lot. So I say, for example, for the first three months, we're going to be a guide together. We're going to help you climb together. But after that, we're going to become more of an oracle. We're going to be there where you need us when you have a big choice to make because you will get it. So I find that people like that because it points the first part of the process is very intense because the day you sign a client is the day you start losing them. Don Draper, shout out. But then when you position yourself as the oracle, it also makes them see the value as in, I will have money, I will have leverage. Well, then an oracle, even though I only consult them once every few months, it's still valuable because of the leverage that I've got. So that's how I position it, essentially. Yeah, because I think about us, right? Like me and you have bounced through many programs, right? And I wonder if that part of that is there's no true program and maybe it just shouldn't exist. But there's no program that truly can serve someone for their entire business career, right? Um, so I'm curious. And if like, there is, ping me, bro. Yeah, <laughs> ping me. Send, well, <laughs> send me the send me the yeah. review. <laughs> well, so, well, something well, something that Alex said in that same in that same video was that you know at some point you could a good idea would be to transition them into some sort of service or 
maybe it's a SaaS or something like that. Because I, I think about my offer, right? It's essentially an info offer for the first week when we're onboarding. I essentially have to build up their foundation from an information and consulting perspective to then use our service to the best of our ability. So it's essentially like a really, really short info product that they get included, right? And then my service is what retains them forever. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. I feel like that's also, that's also something that, and I know a lot of people that have combined info info with service. Um, this is something I was thinking about. I'm sure other people can think about that too. And it only works for certain niches, right? Like I don't know how a fitness coach is going to upsell something else like after they have their dream body like i guess yeah, you could I guess, sell them yeah, like that's that's tough. accountability use my supplements use my supplements i guess that's what prestige labs did there you go yeah there you go yeah <laughs> the other day we were talking forever. about <laughs> yeah or community though you know the other day i sent a picture on the slack channel like i train i'm going to admit i train in a crossfit gym cancel me i don't do crossfit but i train in a crossfit gym and ryan was making fun of me he's like Bro, that better not be a CrossFit gym. I'm like, it is. But you got to admit, these guys know how to turn community into MRR. Like, these guys get it, bro. Like, Ooh, people yeah. who are into CrossFit, they love it. They're like, they want to do their... <laughs> it's the only place <laughs> in the world where it's acceptable for a group of men to do a bunch of jerks. <laughs> you, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Someone's doing this really well is, uh, I don't know if you've seen the default King guys, it's uh, Joey and Joey and Gabe, and it's like a fitness community, but it's, and I think the best way to do this is to really niche down, like to have infinite MRR in the fitness niche. It's like, they're really dialed into like middle-aged American men with like faith and like, uh, like Christian. And it's just like super dialed in, but they're doing really well in that MRR model. And they're doing like in-person stuff and their content's ripping. And I'm like, I think there's a way to do it in the fitness niche. And I've been thinking about this because I'm like, I want a fitness offer. I want to sign a fitness offer. But the problem is that fitness offers are like hard to work with agencies because they just like, they don't charge a lot. So it's like, that's why I haven't really been able to get one. But I think it's interesting to do like the community thing. I think the community is a big part of it. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, community is huge, man. Like cross yeah. teams know how to turn shoulder injuries into MRR. They understand that business. Incredible. They get it. <laughs> it's like the military is like their MRR is that they, they, they set you up to work in the military for six years. You have no skills that work in the civilian world. So now you must resign with us retention. <laughs> That's like the American military. If it ain't it's broken, please don't cancel me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you went to the uh, military. I got one more question. Right? So you went to the military. So there yeah. you go. So That's the caveat. Don't cancel. Yeah. Cause if not, yeah, it's yeah. just going to be one person who's That's going to boring. I have a really good request that I didn't tell you about. So it says, uh, hi, Marcos. There's been a lot of chatter about this new account called Best Ads of All Time. I'd love to hear why JK Molina hasn't posted on it in the past week, and he only posted once in the week prior. He said he won't sell it to you, and I'm curious why. <laughs> because I don't fucking want to sell it on their business, man. That's the point. And, and I'm posting now. I got my VA posting on that account. So that, that account, best dads of all time, at best dads time, something I started of just posting. I call it the best dads of all time, but being real, it's just Porsche ads. Because that's literally the only thing people care about in that damn page. It's it, all if, Porsche ads. If you're not going to sell it, can I just give you the plan that I would put into it that would make it go crazy? Please do. Okay, so I would turn this into a multi-channel brand, and it'd be super automated. I would just have VAs like... uh teach VAs once, create an SOP around the research or with whatever, wherever you accumulate and cultivate ads. And I would turn it into multimedia. I would post videos on there as well, the best commercials, the most hilarious Super Bowl ads, all this stuff. Uh, I would do that on X. I would do it on TikTok. I would do it on Reels and I would do it on YouTube. And I would just drive traffic to the best ads of all time newsletter where you just curate the best ads of all time in there as well. And then, and then eventually... You can you could sell that as as its own enterprise value business. Hello, best ads of all time. You could either monetize with sponsorships. You could do all sorts of stuff. You could quite literally put best ads of all time in the best ads of all time newsletter. So I would turn it into yeah. that. I would I would hire a couple of VAs, build out the system, the operation SOPs to like teach them how to research things. So you don't you put like one hour a week into it. Turn it into multimedia video plus plus stills, and go crazy. What I'm what I'm willing to do. As I'm willing to give you the password and do everything, not willing to sell it, <laughs> but give me, 
give me a percentage of the business and you just make money with it. Send me a check every month, but you can do that if you want to. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. I'll keep okay. that in mind. That's a good offer. Right. That's a good offer. Yeah. Is this our first <laughs> <assist> together? <laughs> <laughs> well, the podcast is kind of a business. Well, it's a distribution one. Do you own, uh, a do you own, do you own best ads of all time.com? I know I own best ads time.com. Best ads time.com. Okay. That's something. Yeah. That's good enough. Um, yeah. I also I mean, own likes and cash.com, views and cash.com, subs and cash.com. And because this is, yeah. We, you can make this a free a free website that just has uh that's just monetized by fucking ads. It's like you don't lose goodwill by advertising because it's an ads page. <laughs> there you <we> go. <laughs> like, yeah. And then, and then when you promote something like a sponsor, you could say, "Hey, here's the best ad of the week." Yeah. Welcome to good. Manscaped. Well, think about it. <laughs> like if you get if you have a if you have the best ads website driving if you drive like 100k visitors to that a month, you can make like a thousand bucks a month. You make a thousand or so a month on X payouts. You make a thousand or so on YouTube payouts. All together, you know, anything from top five to ten thousand. That's like a that's a six figure exit. <laughs> it's good. So, uh, dude, I'm will I'm willing to do that. Like, if I don't do anything, I'm willing to give you the password. Everything, just send me a check every month. You can handle it. It's fine. It's good. Be this is good. That's good private equity. He's learned. He sold a business. This is where the uh, what is it? What's the say? Where the money meets experience, the experience gets the money. <laughs> and the money gets the experience. This I'm about to enter my, my Buffett arc. Yeah. <laughs> Your Belfort <laughs> arc. <laughs> Send me a check every month, little bitch. <laughs> you should. I mean, dude, yeah. I mean, sell, selling a business is, is interesting, but it also is kind of, I mean, it wasn't as big of, a, of an exit as we wanted. You know, so it was like, yeah, yeah well, cool, but it's well with that. You guys also kind of like hit a buzzer beater with the whole API thing, so I don't think it was a bad exit. I hit a buzzer beater. They didn't. You, they yeah, sorry, you hit a buzzer beater with the API thing because like you just incurred a, <laughs> just a casual forty-two k worth of expenses out of nowhere. Uh, you know, yeah. obviously the business is doing fine, but like if anything, you got out at the first top, you know, and then it's like I feel like you did fine, and now you have a sick business. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not complaining. It's just. It was interesting. You know when we sold, did you know? Yeah, good. Joker Willing, good. I have a Joker Willing book there that I haven't read, so clearly I'm, I'm knowledgeable in the subject. Which one? So, you know, um, sure, uh, give me give me a sec. I'm a, I'm gonna bring it up. My favorite is Discipline Equals Freedom. No, this is uh, Leadership Strategy and Tactics. The worst one. I don't know. I, I didn't know you were a Jocko Willink expert. I'm a Jocko Willink. Well, Discipline Equals Freedom was like one of the first books I read that changed my life, like hardcore. Good book. Good book. What's a, what's a, um, okay, first point on this. You know when I sold Tweet Hunter, there were, I got a bunch of comments under that post. What was interesting to me, it's, yes, it wasn't that big of an exit because it was, we made $1.4 million a year. We sold it for 1.4 mil. So essentially 1x what you make in a year. On SaaS, it was common knowledge or like people expected a SaaS to at least exit for 10 times, right? Or five times, right? No, not 10. Maybe let's call it, call it five, three, five, right? So at least five mil, right? So 1.4 was a big disappointment, right? But what was interesting about that is when I sold it, everybody who made less money than me, not everybody, but all the comments about, dude, this was a horrible exit. It was terrible. You made a fucking horrible mistake. You loser. All of them were from people who made less money than me. They're all like 1K he ARR SaaS, <laughs> no code SaaS yeah. guys. Yes. <laughs> so, agency dudes. Yeah. Now. Everybody who made more money than me that messaged me had the same word in it. Congratulations. Because they understood the context. Because it was a 20-year-old kid from Guatemala that did something. So they were like, oh, what's the next thing? So that gave me a lot of peace because it came from people who I admired, not from the people who were making less money than me. So for me, it was really bad. When that happened, I was, I remember I was at jiu-jitsu practice. I was right before entering. And I was just sitting there like with my with my head on my on my hands, thinking, man, I fucked it up. 
like, what did I do? I lost it. But that gave me kind of that strength as in, well, you just start another business. You just do it again because you're, you're enjoying it anyway. I, I feel like that's something I, I haven't talked about publicly, but everybody who made more money than me congratulated me and that gave me a lot of strength. So to everybody who did it, thank you because you really helped me during those times and I, I won't take that for granted. Thank you. I also don't, I think, and I, I learned this now building a, like a building a reasonable business. People underestimate like numbers. Like they don't think one million is a big number. It's a fucking big number. If you make 40, 50 K a month, it takes you a fucking long time to make a million dollars. It does. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's not like you just get, I'm a 50 K a month. I'm a millionaire in a year. No, like have you have to maintain that shit now for like two years to get to $1 million, assuming you're at 50 K a month profit, which is like a yeah. hundred K a month fucking revenue. And now maintain that shit for a year and a half to two years. You're finally at a million. Like people don't understand what an exit is. An exit is like, you just get a check to your bank. Like, and you're instant. out and you're out. You have nothing. Like people, people like I, I started respecting what an exit truly means when I realized like you just get it up front with no attached, no strings attached. So you just get a big fat deposit in your account. And I was like, that's sick because like something that Ryan taught me is like always secure cash collected. And that also resonated with me. Cause like when you secure cash collected, like you, you have the cash, like you don't have to do any additional work to get more cash. Like cash is King, man. Like that it's exits underrated. Like if you have an opportunity to exit, I would use that to, add a little perspective before you make a decision dude when it's like people close a 2k client on a three-month deal and it's a language people use that's very disingenuous and i feel like it makes a lot of people impatient 6k client. hey i closed the 6k client did you yeah i don't know I, I, the day you sign I, a client is the day you start losing them oh really oh time to fucking vent i made this tweet at the beginning of the week where it was like i can, there's something raw, like maybe it's because they're marketers, but like, there's like, I am totally okay if you say revenue and not profit. Like that's normal. Say your revenue because it's revenue. Revenue is revenue. Every business has it. If someone asks you margins, you can tell them. What I don't like is when marketers are flexing the pipeline value of their clients. They're like, just my client just made my client a million dollars in pipeline value <laughs> this month, <laughs> like a million a month. Like that could be zero dollars. You know what I mean? Like, and, and the thing about running an agency is like pipeline value doesn't mean you have to do the work to help your client close that. Like, oh, I drove all the pipeline value. Did your client make money? No. Well, then you didn't do your job, right? It's more than just lead gen, you know, unless you're getting paid per call, which is, you know, that's a good model. Your client needs to make money or you're not going to retain them. So I just, biggest pet peeve, people reflecting fucking pipeline value. Like who cares? How many Dude. sales did they make? <laughs> I'm with you on that one. You know, another pet peeve value that I have, and I wrote this over here, it's when people, and I've done this very often, and I'm 100% projecting, but the need of people online to be a philosopher. Gosh, I just like, <laughs> no. Naval can pull it off. I can't, you can't. So it's people go like, well, in the current state of the market, things as they are, well, my opinion is that lead nurturing is dead. Or like your offer doesn't matter. It, it, like people will give out these absolute approaches as it, this is how it works. This doesn't count. This counts. And it just, I, I found that it made me very impatient. And I noticed it made my clients very impatient too. Hey, this guy says webinars are crushing it. How do I do a webinar? Low ticket communities, that's the way. How do I do that? Well, oh, bro, you know another one? When people say the words game changer, I hate the words game changer. Because when people say, bro, this strategy is a game changer, it's a 1% improvement at best. But there's one to tweet something polarizing. It's a very thin line between being polarizing and fucking annoying and misleading. And I do not enjoy that. I like that. I think that's funny. I also do think there's a lot of life philosophy. There's like a lot of 22 year old, 23 year old, like life coaches on, on Twitter now. And that a lot of them are being polarizing to build like little tribes, which is cool, but it's, uh, 
it's just I just don't get it because it's just not going to make you any money right now. Bro, it's even the marketers. You've seen it. It's even the marketers that do it. Um, Let me get... um, uh, I'm trying to come up with an example, but it's like, cold email is dead. (laughs) No, bro, you're just shit at it. Like, that's just it. You don't understand the nuance. Bro, it's like, this is why I posted this today, actually, because it came came to me because I I was looking out for my, my voice. Social media can be very stressful if you let it. This person is bad. You have to do this or you will not make it. I legit started making more money after I just put two to three guys on the list and just read them. By the way, they never post controversial stuff. It's all very positive. It's very nice. My YouTube feed is all anime Super Smash Bros. video and it actually benefits me because when you listen to everyone, you cannot hear yourself. Stop consuming so much content. You already know what to do. Just go. A lot of influencers that brought me to this point, I've muted them. Because I understand that I kind of got the lesson that I needed to go to the next level. I just need to execute. And I find that it is very dangerous to be uncertain about your strategy and outsource that thinking to tweets that were made 24 hours before. It just, it is very dangerous instead of relying on the fundamentals. But people don't want to do that shit. That's why they're all about like, is it threat for threats now that are hitting or is it long forms that are hitting? And then you're going to tell them, so, they're going to stress so much about which format to use. Whereas the answer is just make people stay on the platform, make it good. The format doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just about just, making it good. I just tweeted this because I got my, we had a, there was like a week and a half, right? Where the algorithm quote unquote was down. Everyone's engagement's down and all this stuff. And even like people on my team, we're like, oh, what should we do? What should we do? I'm like, we've been through this. Well, I've been through this so many times where it's just like engagement's down. Like I don't change everything just because the engagement went down a little bit. Just like stay the course for for a while because what ended up happening, I'll just skip to the outcome, is we just continue doing what we're doing and the algorithm's fine and now everything's hitting again, right? It's just like, as long as you stay true to ourselves and put the content out that's valuable and personable, the algorithm's not going to mean anything. Like the tactics are really just, they're just short term wins. You know what I mean? But the long term is, is, is doing something you can stick to that's valuable and impersonable. Um, I don't know if you saw this like whole drama on, on Twitter recently of this, this kid who basically tweeted. I don't want to talk about that. You saw it? I don't want to talk about it. Let's talk about something. <laughs> okay. Sometimes, you know, you know, Earlier in the business, I, w- I was like kind of plateauing. Earlier in the year, I was plateauing with my business. We just couldn't hit it. It's like, fuck it. Like, how do we get out of this? And I enter that state. Let me read this book. Let me read that book. Let me do this strategy. How's it working? And what I realized is that something that really nailed when I was watching another narco series. So there was this, <laughs> this earthquake in Mexico that uh, it happened in like the 80s and people were his because when the government came to quote unquote help they didn't help they didn't take people out of the rubble thousands of people died in that earthquake in mexico because the only orders the army got was please prevent looting that was the only orders they got so what the quote was just because things stop shaking doesn't mean that there's no serious structural damage so i thought maybe there's some serious structural damage in the business so instead of me going over what is the tactic, the webinar, the email list, the case study format, the thread, the retweets that I need to do, what if I just, what if there's nothing wrong with how I want to go forward, but there's a lot of wrong with what I left backwards, my offer, my positioning, my funnel, my alignment, my content. And when I went back and I fixed the foundations, things started to grow. And this is why I don't like outsourcing a lot of my knowledge to Twitter or like my advice to Twitter because a lot of that advice is what do you do forwards it is very uncommon that you will find someone say maybe it's not that you got to go forwards you got to go backwards and fix it before uh so yeah that was here's a here's a good uh a good analogy for that is so I do used to do IT networking computer networking and whenever you're troubleshooting a problem the same way in business that you just mentioned. Whenever you troubleshoot a problem in computer networking, you use what's called the OSI model, and it's seven seven or eight layers. So the first layer is physical, and physical is essentially, is everything plugged in? Are my wires, did my wires get chewed by a rat, right? Is my computer broken? Did I turn it off and on? That's physical. 
uh, then you move up one and then it's called uh, layer two, which is essentially like you're switching. It's making sure like your IP addresses are good or no, sorry, making sure your uh, physical addresses are good. Everything's good on that end. Then number three is routing, making sure your IP addresses are good, blah, blah, blah. Then you move up the layer and I might butcher it, but it's like application layer to the point where at the very end, it's like quite literally your screen. My Riverside is my Riverside FM broken. No. So I'm making sure everything's plugged in first before I go to Riverside and make sure that my that Riverside.com's not broken, right? So that's the OSI model and how you troubleshoot technical problems. It's the same thing in business. I love that. What is the OSI model for business? I think the OSI model for business depends on the problem, right? I guess, but like, I guess in any, I guess in anything, the number one, in my opinion, is look inwards. It's like, am I the problem? <laughs> and my is my mindset good? Is my mindset good? And is my intentions and my vision back to the, what the original plan was? If no, then I need to do that first because if I don't have my mindset right first, I'm not going to be able to troubleshoot the business. So, am I good? Am I settled? Am I not acting out of emotion? Am I acting in accordance to what the the mission of the business is? Am I acting in accordance to the best outcome for my team, etc.? Right? I'm good. Okay, I'm not going to get shiny object syndrome or some shit. Now I'm going to jump into the business and see where I can see where I can go. And I think depending on the business model, it might look a little different. What do you think? I think the first one is, is uh, yeah, it's skills. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find this, this tweet, but first one is lead flow is down. Have you ever got a point in which you got good lead flow? No. Well, maybe you are the fucking problem because you don't know how to get leads. Well, was there a point in which there was lead flow? Yes. Well, then you know how to do it. Okay, what is the next one? Fundamentals, right? So let, let's create our, the, o, what is it, OSI? Did you say that? O, OSI model, yep. Yeah, so we'll, that's the OSI model for business. So skills goes first. What's second? I think mindset goes first and then skills, personally. I think, oh, uh, okay. Can think about it. Like if you're really, think about it, if, like if you're really good at, if you're really good at writing, but you don't have the mindset of an entrepreneur, you're just going to be a writing employee. That's it. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to, I think you have to be an entrepreneur first and then I think you need skills. And I think after that, after skills. I'd say market. Okay. I see where we're going with this. Yeah. Market. Are you, market, market. Or are you servicing? Yeah. Market slash niche. Are you servicing people who have the money, want to act now? And is you have an actual problem. When I was starting on just starting this entrepreneurship thing, 2017, uh, I went to this conference, not conference, but like this course in college in which everybody kind of bought their products they wanted to fix. So one person actually bought a, a podium that you could like move up and down with a special chair. So it was a big thing. And, uh, she just couldn't do anything with it because she watched Shark Tank. She's like, oh, physical product, that's where it's at. And then it's like, I mean, I understand that this has a very specific use case. If you're in a podium and you're giving a conference and you want to sit down, but it's like, are you solving a real problem here? Yeah. Is is the niche big enough? So for me, it's like market. That's the first one. Yeah. Are, you, are you selling to the right people with the right pain? That's smart. And I think the next one for me, and I think the next two are going to be for me, solution and then channel. And I think solutions first, because the way I think of it, right, is if, if I, if I can write, right, I'm a writer, I have skill and my market is coaches. Okay. I have my market, but what's my solution? I can't just write for coaches, right? I have to have something. I write for coaches to help them make sales. Okay. Now I have a solution and I'm, how am I going to do that? I'm going to use my writing in a way that solves the problem that they don't make sales. All right. And I, and then I think the next one would be the platform. What do you think about those two? Would you say solution is, is kind of the same as offer? Solution slash offer. Yeah. Transformation, whatever, depending on what you want. Um, I think, I think the offer is really just wrapping paper that you put on your solution. Right. So we're, so we're how you settle on mindset goes first. Then we said skills, skills goes second. Then we said market. Mark, then we said solution, solution, yep. offer, same thing. Yep. Then you said channel. I'd say channel, channel. slash distribution. Channel's big. Yeah, channel's big too because I really, there are, and you've probably seen this, there's some offers that just won't hit on certain platforms. It's just fucking facts. Like I've had clients who just 
put it on X, didn't work, and it worked on LinkedIn great. Like it's just some things just work better on other platforms, unfortunately. Like it's just the truth. Uh, like if your markets, you go to where your market's hanging around, right? Starving crowd. Don't, you know what I mean? Don't try to sell hot dogs at a fucking pizza shop. <laughs> that's that's what I think. <laughs> I like that. I like that. So distribution, which is, we're already kind of discovering why a bunch of growth programs don't work because they start with distribution. Send me whatever, I'll retweet it. Yeah, good luck. Like you have, your, it's like, this program solves your computer, fixes your computer virus. Yeah, but your computer's not plugged in, bro. Yeah. Uh, what is what is a program going to do? You know, yeah. And be, below that, I think it's I a little think, tactics. Is the I webinar? Guess. Is it the format? I was gonna say ads, and I think when I say ads, I don't mean oh my god, paid advertising. Because I have this opinion now that I think content and ads are all just becoming the same shit. Like how many YouTube videos that you see from these big YouTubers that are just big giant ads, but they're great content at the same time. So I think content slash ads slash whatever your webinar, I think that's because you have the channel and then you have what you're actually putting out. So I think the quote unquote advertising in the context of actually selling stuff is probably at that, at that end. hundred percent. And yeah. at the bottom it's like the little tactics. Do you use this hook? Do you use that hook? What's yeah. your call to action, which is, the easiest to fix, but because it's the easiest to fix, people confuse that with the first to fix. Yeah. It's not the first to fix. You got to go back. What's my website? I go to your website. Funnel. Yeah, like, what's my sales process? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, you got to make sure all these other things troubleshoot. Like, like you could, you could have the perfect business and then your mindset sucks. And you're just like, I'm not going to stick to the checklist. I have shiny object syndrome. I need to change my offer. Like, it all starts there. And then a lot of people just aren't as good as they think they are. <laughs> like you need to be good. Like that's the most underrated one. I think is skill. Like you have to be good. You have to stand out. You have to be good at something. You can't sell something you're not good at. So yeah, I think it's actually really perfect. By the way, the OSI models, bottom to top, not top to bottom. Oh. So I like the pyramids or with the foundation. Yeah, that's what I was gonna yeah. say. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> not a funnel. I, we're so marketing. It's a funnel. Everything <laughs> has to be a funnel. <laughs> it's a it's a natural. Remember, we don't talk about funnels here. We talk about nachos. It's this yeah. shape of natural. Yeah. It's, okay, so you see this. You see this a lot in in uh, in Segway, and in Seg. Fuck. You see this a lot in dude. I'm thinking about content next to you. Jesus. Okay. You see this a lot in copy. People are like. How do you write copy? How do you like get them hooked to read the next line? You don't have a big idea in place. You don't know what the offer is you're going to promote. You don't know who you're talking to. You don't know what the biggest pain points are, which is why copy, 90% of copy is who are you talking to? Like people don't want to figure that out. They're like on the 10%. Like I've told this story many times, but I want to tell it again, man. When I was in Austin with Dakota and Dan, dude, these guys are jacked, just like jacked. And they eat pancakes and ice cream and syrup and toast. And I'm like, dude, I'm there like obsessing about my macros and just getting the fucking almond milk, bro. I got almond milk and they're like, what are you doing, right? <laughs> so, so I asked them, yeah, and, and I was not as, as, I'm not in shape like them. So I asked them, Dan, Dakota, sit out. They're like, okay. Why are you guys, why do you guys have a six pack and why don't I have a six pack? What's going on? And they're like, bro, two things that matter when it comes to having a good body. It's protein and it's caloric intake you, and exercise, right? And sleep, right? So if you focus on those variables, you can literally eat ice cream like us and it won't matter because you're taking care of the main thing, not the almond milk. And I feel like a lot of people focus on the almond milk of business, the things that make a 1% difference instead of the things that make a 50% difference. The 50% difference, it's hard. It takes a long time. But if it were easy, everybody would do it. If nobody wants to look backwards. And that's where nobody wants to follow the fucking OSI model. Right? So I, I totally agree. I, and I think this was, was a good one. Yeah, I think like I haven't have you ever just seen like an offer that just sells itself? It just like that's an offer that just crushes. Asymmetric it delivers asymmetric values. It repeatedly can help people transform. The offer guarantee is great. 
everything is just so good about the person selling it is really good at what they do. Their product's really good. Their solution's really good. It's just like, because they have that strong foundation, they're a killer. They have the perfect offer. They're really good at what they do. The rest of the stuff is so much easier and less impactful. Like they already have 90%. I would argue that the first three out of that six are like 90% of what, what helps you succeed, right? If you have the best offer, the best skill and the best mindset in the world, like the other stuff's going to be like only a little bit of what it's just little tweaks and boom, you're successful. Whereas you can yeah. have the entire top of the funnel down, but you have no skill. Like you, you're not good and you have no mindset. Like you're not going to sell anything. So a hundred percent, bro. A hundred percent. One time a lead gen guy, lead gen guy, that was his, that was his thing. Joined the program. And I asked him, what is a quick win we can help you get? He's like, bro, I just really struggle with getting leads. I'm like, bro, what the fuck uh, 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 is wrong with you? <laughs> Let's go. It's like business coach, monthly revenue, 2K a month. Yeah. Okay, I found the problem. Yeah. I know Ghost exactly what's going Ghostwriter, about. I really struggle writing tweets. <laughs> like, I don't know how to have enough ideas. I get this all the time, actually. How do you get enough ideas? Like content ideation is like your core skill. Hello. Like it's like the main skill of a ghostwriter. It's like you know how to write and you know how to get good ideas. That's it. <laughs> and then you put them online. Uh, yeah, it's so funny. That this is and it makes sense too, because if you look at the OSI model, right? If you have everything's good good to go, but it's not plugged in. <laughs> and this has happened to me. I was in I when I was in IT, my sergeant would come over and I'd be like, It's not working, sergeant. What? What do you mean it's not working? They just this has happened to me when I was a private. They walk over to the wall. Did you check if it was plugged in or did you turn it off and on? And it's so embarrassing because you're the IT guy and the sergeant was like ex infantry. He doesn't know shit about computers. He's like, Did you turn it off and on? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> fuck. And, and I'm praying it doesn't work. I'm like, I go to turn it off. And I'm like, please don't let it work because I don't want to look like a fucking idiot. <laughs> And then I go and turn it off and on, and it's like, and it works perfect. I'm like, ah, uh, and then they, right? So it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like when you, when you're a kid and you're like, mom, I can't find this toy. And she's like, I'm going to go there. I'm going to find it. And she's like, it's right on the table. It's like, what the fuck is this, Marcos? It's right yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, no way. But <laughs> she's like, yeah, I, it's exactly like that. And, it's the same way, the same way with the model. And this is why, this is why you pay for a coach half the time is to just essentially have a bird's eye view of your business and look at it and be like, dude, like you're, all, you're fucked up here, not way up here, right? You're, your funnel is not the problem. You could just look at someone's business because the person in the business is information overload with their business, their stress, their emotional, they have all these things. When you're the coach, you can just look at it and be like, dude, you're just not plugged in. You know, you 100%. When you get that information overload, you know what's really helpful? It's, I really believe, well, you asked me this last time. It's like, who are you reading right now? I'm like, I'm reading nobody. I'm just listening to myself. Because oftentimes, you already know what to do. So if you ever encounter yourself in that situation in which you're like, I don't know what to do. Nothing's working. It is very dangerous to go hunting for tactics because you're going to the last level of the model instead of going to the, is it plugged in? So for me, the best way to attack that it's take a break, take a day, you know, sleep, go watch a movie or something. And then you're going to realize, oh, the problem maybe wasn't as big as I thought. Yeah. I've, uh, I, I had to learn that the hard way. Like I, with my agency, I was thinking a lot about scaling and I was like, oh, should I go to like 20, 30, 40 clients and have a team of 15 and all this stuff? And I'm, and I go and of course I go tactic hunt. And of course I land on like Andrew Wilkinson. He's like, I have seven agencies and one of them has 170 employees. And I'm like, now I'm like, it's in my head when all I should have done is go and listen to my audiobook of Game of Thrones and just listen to fucking zombies fighting fucking Starks and shit. Like I probably would have got out of that and been like, yeah, nothing was wrong. I could just go listen to Game of Thrones. And I've gotten a better appreciation for fiction. And I know we share the love of anime and like I've gotten a better love for fiction and things that can take my mind off of business and content and not just like consume content all day long for on the business side, you know? It's just like you get too much in your head. Dude, and you paint you pointed something that was really interesting. Leisure. Don't consume business content as leisure. That shit's dangerous, bro. Do not do that. Listen to something else. I when I that. bought a copywriting course, bro, 
I, when I bought a copyrighted course, I was making two fifty a month, and I bought a two hundred fifty five dollar copyrighted course. And when I was going through that course, one of the lessons, one of the modules, was literally take a break. And I remember, bro, I was like, "Fuck this guy! He does not understand business, right?" <laughs> Turns out it's actually very helpful. <laughs> like you take a break and you come back with the answer, just like that. And then it's like, finished? bro, I, I used to, I, sorry, I used to play piano, right? I'm like the all, all Asians as kids play piano. So there you go. Figure it out. So I used to play piano and there was this piece that just, it, it didn't come up to me. I just, I just couldn't play it. I took a nap. When I woke up, played it perfectly. Sometimes you just need that. And that is a very key component and a discipline you need to learn in business. Resting ain't easy. Yeah. And I also think this is, and I'll finish it with a practical tip. It's like, what I've learned or what I've been able, the ideas I've been able to generate where I'm just like either on leisure or consuming leisure content where it's just like a show or an anime or something or a fiction book, the the content I've been able to be inspired to create from that is far more unique and interesting than the content ideas I get from just like business books because everybody's read the same business books and everybody just gets the same ideas and just regurgitates the same shit they learned in cash advertising and the copywriting handbook and $100 million offers and just regurgitating the same shit that everyone's already read. Whereas if you go and consume fiction and just go on walks and like do normal shit, go do jujitsu, go on a run, go to the gym, go watch an anime, you'll get far better inspiration for unique content that's actually different than everybody else. And that's something I've learned. I learned a lot in the past month is I get my best content ideas when I'm not consuming business content. There you go. Period. There, I love that. I'll end it as in cash advertising. That's at the bottom of the uh, the last thing you should do on the OBI model or whatever you said. The always have advertising. Yeah. Yeah. Cash advertising. You know, it's like the framing for the fifty percent discount you're gonna make. That's the last thing you need to worry about. Hundred million dollar offers. That's the third. That's in the middle. What's even better? You know, the foundational ones. You know, it's like influenced by Cialdini, Ogilvy, Thor Hopkins, breakthrough advertising, rich dad, poor dad. <laughs> you had to go there. Right? I had to go lower, lower. <laughs> That's just thank you, grow secret. <laughs> yeah, the secret. <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta, you gotta read it in Hebrew, though. Yeah. English translations, the word. You gotta Chron chronological it. Hebrew, chronological Hebrew. Yeah. You're too soy if you don't go chronological Hebrew. <laughs> This was a good one. I think it's a, it's a good place to end it. Go read the Bible. That's the message of today's podcast. Thank you for listening in. Cheers. Cheers.